Well, I've been coming to LA Blockchain Summit for a while. Uh, came from the traditional world uh, back in 2013, ran an asset management firm called Morgan Creek Capital Management. We started to go down the digital asset rabbit hole uh, over the course of the next few years, formed Morgan Creek Digital in 2018, and started being asked to speak at conferences, so speaking here tomorrow, uh, but also want to be here to engage with the community that you know is building uh, during the fun time of bear market, right? <coughs> A uh, little bit of entertainment, so I, I, you know, I invest, my day job is investing, so I run a venture capital fund that invests in you know, the founders who are building things in the digital asset ecosystem, but certainly in the entertainment business for the speaking role. So before we get to the financial VC, I want to kind of stick with entertainment, because I don't have it. Yeah. So essentially, NFTs are going to become the new merchandise, the new happening in the for movies and TV shows. Is it also going to become kind of a pre-sale? Well, the way I look at NFT is maybe a little bit different. In fact, I, I kind of um, wish they hadn't been uh, identified as just JPEGs, right? Or, or just things. Uh, really what we're talking about is a non-fungible token, hence, hence the name NFT. But what does that really mean? Well, it means an entry on a ledger uh, blockchain and what that really means is digital property rights so anything that can be titled whether it's a building like this building we're standing in whether it's a piece of music or a piece of art a uh, collectible car a case of wine a uh, stock a bond a currency anything that can be titled will eventually be an NFT so will people use them for tickets, sure. Will people use them for uh, collectibles? Sure. Will you know people bond around them as, as communities? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I think it becomes much bigger than that. And every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, and every piece of uh, value in the world will ultimately be an NFT. Okay, so, um, Web3 and NFTs was kind of an origination a way to cut you or people like you out of the picture was an artist can bypass the corporation in the middleman and deal directly with their fans the thousand true fan theory. right so is that still true and how does it how, how are you in the space and navigating your way in a web three world where it seems to be diversifying into something completely different than where it started well important point so you know, I invested, so I'm old, right? Been around a long time. So I invested in Web1 when it was being formed and there were no connected devices, right? We had client server technology, we had big mainframes, you know, there were none of these supercomputers we walk around in our, in our hands. And investing in the internet was important because we were laying the groundwork for connection. And we basically allowed media and commerce to be disrupted. And that value that used to exist in the big media companies, the big commerce companies, eventually went to internet related companies. Then internet became invisible. I mean, we don't talk about internet companies. We all use the internet every day. We don't talk about it that way because it's invisible, like your cell phone. Then we went to the mobile net and web two. And the mobile net allowed social media and social programs and social networks to emerge, which allowed people to, the, the owners of those monopolies and duopolies, to monetize their clients. So we all provided content, right? We put up pictures of our family, we talked to one another, we, we put up other forms of content, we made videos for YouTube, and the owners of those platforms in Web 2 got all the value. Well now in Web 3, to your point, that middle person, that person who has been monetizing that value, is now suddenly looking at us and saying, wait a second, a creator can own the content. You know, I can own my attention. I joke, when I go buy Best Buy store, the store, my phone should blow up, should miss you, we've, all the things you've been looking at all week, we've got them all set out, you get 20% off today. They don't have to advertise to me ever, right? And why should an advertiser get 
access to my data. That's my data. Why shouldn't I own that? It's my attention, my commerce. Same thing in a creator. If a creator in the old days had to go through a music label and an intermediary, today they can create content, sell it directly to, uh, the med uh, to, to their, uh, their customer, their consumer. In fact, you may or may not have seen the, the TikTok crypto boy. So there was a young woman, she made this TikTok, and it was an open verse challenge where you sing a verse and then you ask other people to sing a verse and she cobbled them together and made a song all about crypto. And her basic message was, I don't want to hear about your NFTs. Don't talk about them. I don't want to hear about your crypto. I don't care about it. And I wanted to do the open verse challenge. My daughter said, Dad, you cannot be on TikTok. Uh, and I wanted to say back, look, hon, you don't want to hear about NFTs. Fine, got it. Okay, but here's the thing. You made this song. It's actually pretty good. It's blowing up TikTok, blowing up Twitter. But instead of you getting rich, ByteDance, who owns TikTok, is getting rich. If you turned it into an NFT, you could own it, and you'd be getting rich. So there's an example where a creator using digital property rights, NFTs, could own her content and eventually uh, you know, uh, benefit from that. In fact, it was funny. At the end, Pussy Riot had her come up on stage, and they did an NFT together and actually did monetize. So it was kind of cool. So do you think the regulation is going to be good? Look, regulation will ultimately be good uh, because it will ultimately embrace the new technology as it always does, right? We have good regulation for the internet today. When the internet was first started, we had regulation that tried to kill the internet because the voice over, I mean, uh, the telephone companies didn't want voice over internet protocol. They like charging $3 a minute for long distance. Free sounded bad to them. And you go back to the turn of the century with the automobile. Right? We have good regulation now about cars. Back then, the regulators, regulations were put in place like the red flagging rule, which said you had to hire someone to walk in front of your horseless carriage with a red flag to warn other people. We don't see that anymore. So regulation is part of what I call the then they fight you phase, the famous Gandhi quote that Gandhi didn't say. You know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So 2009 to 15, when we created crypto, first they ignore you. Bunch of nerds and geeks, who cares about you guys? Then they laugh at you, 2016 to 21. Ah, bunch of nerds and geeks playing with their magic internet money, ha ha ha, whatever. Now we're in the then they fight you phase. So 2022 to 2027, they're gonna fight, and they're gonna fight hard. And so your question, is regulation good or bad? Regulation is agnostic. It can be used for good or bad, ultimately, Less is probably better, some is good, but ultimately it will embrace these good technologies that are as inevitable as the internet, as the mobile net, and the truth net, right? Which is blockchains being where all value is exchanged will eventually dominate. It's so funny. It's all right. Let's start with, what is Web4 going to do? You know, Web 4 got skipped, right? So we got Jack out there saying now we're on Web 5, and we skipped Web 4 because the number 4 sounds like death in Chinese or something. I don't know. Ultimately, whether we call it 3, 5, 6, it doesn't matter to me. What it is is an evolution of technology, the same way that technology has been evolving for 60 plus years, right? As I said, when I was growing up, there were no connected devices. There were only mainframe computers. Then we had mini computers, and suddenly small businesses could have those computing power, that computing power, because in 1968, there was an innovation around microchips. 54 was the mainframe, 68 was the microchip, then 14 years later, and it's always 14 years, because it's always the creative class, the young people that create everything new. 1982, personal computer, where I grew up in Seattle, gets created. Steve Ballmer's mom says, honey, why'd you work for that company? No one want a computer in their house. Now we all have computers in our house. So he has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. 14 years later, the internet comes along. And that innovation was inevitable. Then 14 years later, the mobile net. And now we all live on these little things. And in 2024, which is still a year and a half away, the truth net, where blockchain replaces iOS and Android as the operating system for the internet of value and everything of value. Will it be exchanged over blockchains the same way that all information and commerce is done over the internet? 
Yep. Um, in, in the industry, do you have an association that represents that industry? Yeah. 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 Do you believe that the, the originator, the, the, the first yeah, the first adopters, ought to get together and set? I mean, obviously, yeah. regulations when it comes to government, probably big corporations. Yeah. Have to yep. But should you want some of the smaller people who are early adopters get together to form some sort of market driven protocols? Like, you know, yeah. internet regulation is not, you can't spam, but I can market with spam. But it is a market driven protocol. Are there a set of things that ought to exist within Web3 that should be put forth? Before regulation comes Look, another really important question. I would say questions are way more important than answers. So those are really important and good questions in that regulation historically is created by the incumbents. So it is not friendly toward the new technologies. And ultimately, to your point, if you want good regulation, positive regulation, you probably should be involved in the crafting of that regulation problem is most regulations it's crafted by the those in power and it's both sides of the aisle, left right center doesn't matter it's just whoever's in power whoever's funding the lobbying and so right now you have the incumbents the big banks who don't like the fact that capital is leaving to go into digital assets you got you know the middle people who don't want the ownership economy to exist they're perfectly happy taking their rents for making these platforms available. So I 100% agree that there should be uh, regulatory committees or bodies that try to craft regulation. The problem is we still have too much tribalism, you know, the Bitcoin maxis versus the ETH heads and, and the Web3 people. And until we can get along and collaborate, we're probably going to end up with hodgepodge regulation that just slows the whole process down. Now, will you eventually, we win. And that's the, you know, the fourth part of the quote from Gandhi is then you win. Well, the good news, if you're in Web3, if you're here at this conference, you've already won. Right? That's the cool part. You actually cut to my next question. So we can just jump right to you. Uh, so, um, It's not going to 100,000 in the so uh, We all know regulation and big money has to come up. It's the only thing that's But what has changed is ETH has gone to proof of stake. So do you believe that ETH is going to increase more than Bitcoin and the gap between ETH and Bitcoin is going to shrink because ETH is based on good service and technology whereas Bitcoin is it's a limited supply and demand on our pyramids. So is the difference in the gap between the two going to shrink and ETH is going to become more you know, stable but a better investment? Yeah, so I'll push back on just about everything in the question. So, you know, Bitcoin is a blockchain. It is the first use case of blockchain technology. It has the critical mass. It wins by Paul Romer, who won the Nobel Prize for Law of Increasing Returns. It does have the critical mass to make it uh, the first mover. And I would say digital assets are, are like Saudi politics. There's the king, the crown prince, and everyone else who hates each other, all the other princes that hate each other. So you got Bitcoin as the king, Ethereum's the crown prince, then a whole bunch of other princes that are fighting for the last few slots. If you think about what is Bitcoin today? Bitcoin is digital gold. And yeah, the price is volatile, but price is not value. Here's an interesting stat. If you go back two years to when the lockdown started, if you look at the price of Bitcoin then, the price of Bitcoin today, it's up exactly 100%, which is exactly what it should have done because we doubled the supply of dollars. So we printed half of all the dollars in the history of the Republic, 246 years, we printed half of them in an 18 month period. Therefore, Bitcoin, since it's priced in dollars, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, never changes. But we don't price Bitcoin in Bitcoin. We price Bitcoin in dollars or euros or yen or renminbi. And so if you look at Bitcoin in Turkish lira, there's never had a bear market. It's never gone down in price. If you look at it in Venezuelan bolivars, it's never had a bear market or at Argentinian pesos. In dollars, it went down from November to June. Why? Because of liquidations. We had a massive withdrawal of liquidity from the Fed and other central banks around the world, and leveraged speculators had to sell. And they don't get to sell what they want to sell, they had to sell what they could sell. 
So, but if you look at the price over the long term, price went from 10,000 to 20,000, which is exactly in dollars what it should have done relative. And gold, interestingly, didn't do its job. It didn't go up 100% over that period, which it should have. Gold's been a perfect store of value for 5,000 years. Well, why didn't gold work? Gold's being spoofed by JP Morgan and all the others, and there's lots of data on that. So back to the question on ETH versus Bitcoin, Ethereum is a very interesting protocol. It's got a lot of use, right? There are a lot of people building on it, a lot of development. I'm not a big fan of proof of stake versus proof of work. I think proof of work is the best consensus mechanism. Proof of stake has elements of everything that we hate. Right? We hate that the big banks make the rules. We hate that those who have the most wealth create the rules. In a proof of stake world, it's possible for the person with the most, he who has the gold makes the rules. So I'll argue that that probably wouldn't have been my choice, but because the installed base of Ethereum is so large and there's so many people building on it, I think it probably survives and probably thrives. Whether its price does better relative to Bitcoin, I think is an unsolvable question because that's just supply and demand. Depends on you know how many people want to buy it and how many people want to sell it. The thing about Bitcoin that's interesting is it's been in existence for 14 years, you know, 14th birthday yesterday of the white paper on Halloween. In every year except two, the low for the year was higher than the previous low, which means the network is growing. And if you plot the network value, according to Metcalf's law, we follow a perfect parabolic growth curve uh, of Bitcoin in terms of users and transactions. Ethereum's not quite as easily modelable because it's got a lot of episodic building and there's a lot of competition, right? Is Solana faster, better, cheaper? Yes, but it's only 99% accurate. So if I'm doing gaming, love it. If I'm doing accounting, not gonna use it ever. I need 100% accuracy. So I think the big question, the $64 trillion question is in the internet, we have five protocols, right? There used to be 80 protocols, say there are five. There's TCP IP, the base layer. Well, IP is the base layer, then TCP IP above that. Then we have uh, FTP to transfer files. We have HTTP for uh, websites. We got SMTP for email, and we got www. that ties it all together. Are we gonna have a single stack world? Bitcoin, the base layer, Filecoin like FTP, Ethereum like the www dot, and maybe Polkadot, Solana, something in the middle, Cosmos, don't really know. Or are we gonna have a multi-chain world where Bitcoin is a blockchain, Ethereum's a blockchain, Solana's a blockchain, and we have bridges across those chains? Don't know. Or are we just gonna have one? Is it Bitcoin only, lightning on top of it, L3s, L4s, and the entire monetary system transfers to that? Don't know, but whoever figures it out, like I said, $64 trillion question. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so maybe in terms of you investing, yeah. do you think these penny stock chains, if you will, yeah. are going to have to kind of specialize in utility base and attract yep. people to their platform based on specific utility? Yeah, again, such, such an important question. The whole idea that assets exist for pure speculation pisses me off, right? Because it hurts us as an ecosystem if we're trying to develop a technology, if people are punting around on these penny stock scams, right? It's like the ICO craze. So if you think about markets, there are four types of participants in any market, whether it's a market for spices, a market for stocks, or a market for cryptocurrencies. There are investors. Investors buy things that sell below their fair value. Okay? There are traders that don't give a shit about fair value. They just want movement. And they want to buy and they want to sell and they want to scalp. Really hard to do, but some people like to do it. Then there are speculators. A speculator is simply the opposite of a hedger. A hedger has to sell something that they produce to protect their business. Like oil producers have to sell their oil forward in the market. Or a corn producer sells their corn and the speculator takes a long position against that producer short position. 
Then there are gamblers. Gamblers don't care about anything except price moving. And if the price is moving, they'll buy it. Mostly dominated by guys, right? Because we're hunter-gatherers. And like my wife says, go get the ketchup. I open the fridge, no ketchup. She walks up, grabs the ketchup. If it ain't moving, I don't see it because I'm a guy. So if you think about the gamblers and what we had in the past two years after the lockdowns is we had the worst of all possible worlds. We locked people in their apartments. We took away all the things they could gamble on. We gave them free money and they started gambling on stocks, meme stocks and crypto. And so you have all these nonsense stocks like the dog stocks. And to your question, I said a year ago that the bear market will be over when Doge is zero. And all the Doge is, oh, you're kidding, it's, it's great, it's awesome. I'm like, awesome for what? It's a joke, it has no utility, it has no developers. And to your point, if it could be used for utility, you know, Parler was gonna try to re-emerge uh, as a platform and use it for their platform, okay? Maybe Elon is gonna try to put it into Twitter now and I'll just go somewhere else. But ultimately, without utility, punting around in penny stocks, look, it's been going on for centuries. Long before crypto, people punted around in illiquid, low-priced assets and used leverage. It's a recipe for disaster, and it's why most people blow up and lose all their money. It's like going to Vegas, right? You go to Vegas, and you play a hand, and you win, go home. The longer you stay, the more you're gonna lose. It's just the way the world works. And punting around in penny stocks or penny cryptos, recipe for disaster. Okay, so I wanna to get to mass adoption. Okay. We get to that. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, four days, cyberpunks, yep. labs, kind of set the bar. 300 in the world, so it's like, well, I have been at Yep. Yet nobody has duplicated what they've done. Is that a flash in the pan? Was it a fluke? Is it a um, the communities are really important. Communities are maybe the most important thing in Web3. And first mover clearly has a huge advantage because how many really active, really creative people are there? It's probably more than 10,000, but it's probably not hundreds of millions. And so when a community is formed, like Bored Apes or, or Punks, you're going to get the leaders you're going to get the most creative, the most innovative, the most forward thinking. And you're going to get some others, some hangers on and some speculators and some punters. But, but ultimately, that community is going to be pretty strong. And there are a lot of examples in both of those communities of real creators trying to create real things. Now, someone tried to explain it to me that they said, it's like, imagine if you were 50 years ago, you sat down and down from the heavens came Sam Lee and said, hey, do you want to buy Spider-Man or Thor? Nope, it's not like that, because those were different. And Spider-Man, here's the crazy thing. When uh, Carl Icahn sold Marvel, I mean, uh, bought Marvel, um, everyone said he was an idiot, right? And when Disney bought Marvel for $6 billion, they said they were idiots. Disney made more on the last Spider-Man movie than $6 billion. One character, one movie. And so the idea that all 10,000 bored apes are going to be Spider-Man, never going to happen. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I think the communities are really important. I think the idea of creating content from the community, really intriguing, uh, like the Loot Project was interesting. But ultimately, a community has to do something important. Like I'm part of the on-chain monkeys. And people say, well, what's that? They are a community designed around monetizing karma, right? If you do something good in the community, you get recognized and you get a currency that you can use to do other good things. And so I like that idea. And I think that community has a chance to grow into something interesting. But how many, you know, pixelated, you know, monk or animals are we all going to own? I don't know. I mean, I feel badly for the guy who bought uh, Zuck's first tweet, right? Or, 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 or somebody's first tweet. Maybe it was Elon's first tweet. You know, for like $1.2 million, and he sold it for 30 bucks. So just because something's scarce doesn't make it valuable. Scarcity 
needs demand to create value. And ultimately, most Me Too projects will fail, as we've seen. But true communities, I think, will thrive in Web3. Ah, I think you're right. I think it was Jax first. Yeah, that's right. You're right. It was Jax. Yep. I do want to get into the, can we save the world with NFT? Yeah. I want to talk about mass adoption. The first time I heard about mass adoption, part of it was tied to the government, you know, doesn't just get involved, but sets the tone to allow for mass adoption. Mm -hmm. Now, mass adoption is kind of a, like, you hear different people describing the thing. So I've come up with a, a separate term, kind of adoption of the masses. Yeah. The mass adoption is going to, to most people I talk to, half the people won't even know they're using NFT. Correct. The mortgage, the car type, yes. It will be implemented in your life whether you know it or not. Correct. So what are the obstacles or what's going to get us to mass adoption, much less the point for whether you're 8 or 80, you're, I mean, what was it, a couple of years ago, everyone, Bitcoin, 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 right? Absolutely. So those are kind of two different marks. If you want. Yep. Mass adoption is a really important point. I like the way you flip it around to say adoption of the masses, because that's ultimately what it is in the sense that every technology goes through the same S-curve, right? It takes about a decade for the first 10 percent, it takes another decade for the next 80 percent, and another decade for the maturity and then, you know, gone on beyond that. And you can go back and map just about any technology. And in that early adoption phase, it is painful, right? I mean, you actually have to know what you're doing. I mean, remember when you had to set up your first modem to actually connect to the internet? Or you wanted to uh, download a, a movie from Netflix? It took four days. Who will wait four days for anything, right? It almost went bankrupt twice because no one was gonna wait that long. So I think the same thing's true in, in where we are today in, in crypto, is crypto, and crypto is simply cryptographically secure technology for securing these tokens in blockchains, right? Non-fungible tokens, digital property rights. And to your point, in the future, it will be as invisible as this, right? I don't understand how I talk into this glass and metal box and my wife hears my voice in real time on the other side of the country. Makes no sense to me, shouldn't work, but it does. I don't really care how it works. I just know that I want to own it, I want to use it. But the first time the mobile phone came out, people weren't sure they wanted to have one, they weren't sure they wanted to use it, or the first time you put your credit card on the internet, oh, you were sure it was gonna get stolen. Now, we use our credit card all the time, we double click on the side of the phone. So, bearer assets are a little trickier, right? Digital assets, bearer assets are a little trickier. If you put your assets in a low quality custodian or exchange, they can be hacked, okay? They can't be hacked on chain, right? 14 years of Bitcoin, not one fraudulent transaction. Just let that sink in for a second. It's been up 99.99% of the time, like 26 minutes of downtime, not one fraudulent transaction. How many hackers around the world have tried to hack the Bitcoin blockchain? Gazillions, technical term. So they've been unsuccessful, why? Because it's the most secure, most powerful computing network by 1,500 times. It's 1,500 times more powerful, more powerful than the CERN supercomputer. So when we think about that level of security and that level of, of technological innovation, to me, it is inevitable that it will be used by everybody. But it has to be invisible, right? You won't know that your marriage license is an NFT. You won't care. You'll just know that you have it in your wallet. You won't have to worry, did I bring my wallet with me and my driver's license, my physical card? No, ridiculous, okay? It'll be in the cloud, secure, cryptographically secured, and you can punch it up on demand anytime you want using a hardware uh, security module. So ultimately, to me, that's the big opportunity is wallets and security modules. So the same way that the browser made the internet invisible to all of us, that these made the mobile net invisible to all of us, the wallet will make Web3 invisible to all of us. I probably got time for two more. All right. Right now, we have regulation 
can only do custodial locks. Yep. Uh, we have regulation in Switzerland, like called Crypto Valley, that is certifying the companies that are operating in the space as their regulation. Yep. Otherwise, it's the wild, wild west, and there's no sharing whatsoever. Yeah. Right? And so, is, is regulation going to be more like, say, you know, how ACH is made about it? We have a set of protocols worldwide that everybody signs on here. Yeah. Or is the U.S. going to be the dominating force? This is it, and everybody better follow suit. Again, absolutely brilliant question. I mean, maybe the most important question we've talked about yet. For 20 years, we had this whole industry called FinTech. The problem was there was no tech, <laughs> right? We're using ACH, Fedwire, and Swift. No technological innovation. It was just a better UI, UX to take things that we didn't like to do in the bank, outside the bank. So now people don't get their mortgage from the bank, they get it on their phone. They lend peer to peer. So FinTech created an industry and actually a lot of wealth uh, for companies like Chime, but with no technological innovation. Now we actually have technological innovation. We have a new set of rails, right? If I want to send, if I had a mother-in-law in El Salvador, which I don't, she's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but if she were in El Salvador and I want to send her a dollar, she would get 70 pesos. Why? Well, because the Rothschilds have to get paid for the international settlements, and then you got Western Union has to get paid, and there's just a lot of friction. And that friction is about $7 trillion a year that the big banks skim from all of us around the world using ACH, Fedwire, and SWIFT. So to your point, unless everyone says, yep, we're going to use the Bitcoin blockchain as the global settlement layer, and we use Lightning on top of it or something else, or we say we're going to use Ethereum network product or something like that, I think it's going to be a challenge. So what's more likely to happen is some countries will fight against it because the incumbents will pay to try to impede the progress of that technology. We're seeing that in the U.S. already, right? They went after the lenders. They went after some of the other uh, money transfer people. So ultimately what happens is like squeezing air in a balloon. Air just goes someplace else. So it'll move to Estonia or, you know, Japan or South Korea or other places where tech innovation is embraced. I would hope the U.S. would take their leadership position globally and say, you know what, if we help set the rules, we can manage an orderly transition to this new set of rails. Probably not very hopeful for that, but I would like them to, to go there. Okay, so if I look at one more, yeah. I want to go in a completely different direction. All right. I would imagine as an investor, you're looking at the implementation of blockchain into already existing hot sectors. Yeah. So let's talk about bio data. Uh -huh. So in, we live in a world where half of the world, the younger half, no problem. Take all my data, sell me whatever you want. The older half, like, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 23 and me was kind of the first that made everybody yep. up. Yep. So there's a lot of people talking about, oh, I want to own my data, and that's why. Yep. So can you see a world where companies, or are you looking for companies, you can't answer yeah. this, but yeah. that are basically using blockchain, the ability to, I can put my information in blockchain, I can toggle on what I want to be able to be able to look at, what I want is research, universities, of the companies that are doing the research to be able to say, okay, I have a free history in my family of cancer, yep. I want you to be able to screen me and 100,000 other people to find a cure for cancer. Yep. Is this a revolutionary <coughs> way that we're going to help cure some of the so again, really important question, deep question. Um, I believe every industry will be completely disrupted by blockchain technology, from voting to food to logistics to money to finance and healthcare. Uh, you bring up a couple of really important points. Our medical data system globally is broken. Right? My mom had a terrible experience because she went to a hospital out of network and they couldn't get her medical record, so they treated her without knowing her previous history. How is that even possible in, in today's day and age? But two systems didn't talk to each other. 100% all of us should have our identity, a digital identity that we control, and that, as you said, can toggle on and off access. You don't have to know who we are. You can just have access to our data. It can be anonymized or random if we want. It could have our name associated if we want. And we should be able to grant that and cryptographically secure blockchains allow that to happen. 
in the health space, why it's so potentially beneficial is one, uh, you can identify people who are at risk of certain things and treat them in advance. Actually do health care instead of sick care. Our whole system is around sick care. Wait till you're sick, then get care. How about we head off the pass? Uh, you also have the issue of the massive amount of data on a global basis where, you know, we think about 40% of the people in the world don't have a bank account, so there's no financial information on them, but they have a cell phone, okay? We can create digital identity for all of those people and gather data, again, in a anonymized fashion that can help with drug discovery, testing, um, clinical research uh, op, uh, uh, experiments, et cetera. And so the ability to opt in, opt out, uh, to literally control not only your information, but your activity and your engagement with the industry uh, much, much better in my mind. So I do think that, that the biotech and the healthcare system will be huge beneficiaries of blockchain technology over the long run. In the short run, they're gonna fight it tooth and nail because it reduces their monopoly power, right? They, like the financial institutions, are middle people, right? I mean, think about it. Why do we have these large companies in the U.S., all they do is process claims, right? They don't actually manage healthcare, right? They don't have doctors or nurses. They just manage paperwork back and forth, and there's no transparency. We don't know what it costs. I'll give you a good example. There's a company that did a study for Walmart and they got all the people that had knee replacements. And the range was 40,000 to 120,000. And they said, all right, no one gets 120,000, okay? But no one has to go to 40 either. But we're only gonna reimburse 80, and we're gonna cut our costs. And so having transparency into what things cost, having quality information, like that doctor or that nurse has this track record. We keep track record on everybody else. Why don't we do it in healthcare? Uh, and then there's the whole bioinformatics and, and biotechnology revolution that could be enhanced by having a bigger data set. And then the last thing is insurance, right? Why do we have separate insurance pools for each state, each company? It's ridiculous. It should be a single payer system, a single pool of risk. That's how insurance works best when it's a huge pool of risk. So lots of ways to improve the healthcare business. It's safe to say that blockchain is going to change the platform. Blockchain is making a better world in real time. Uh, I think we are better off in many areas because, because of blockchain technology. And it is an inevitable future technology that will 10 years from now, 15 years from now, be as invisible as the internet and the mobile net and used every day and embraced just like our previous technological innovations.